Um, it's kind of interesting, but the phone call because uh, I'm here to talk about hyperculture, which is often through internet. But myself, uh, I always need the phone call to, to think things are real. So that's kind of what I was going to talk about maybe in... Um, I wanted this to introduce a little bit of background, but not in depth. I can talk about it later to the ones that want to know more about Klingen Band. And I also wanted you to be feel free to uh, ask questions anytime it comes to mind, because uh, I thought of it more of a chat situation than an actual lecture of any kind. And, um, um, just to begin telling a little bit about the Klingoban, it's a, a space. Uh, is it not loud enough? <laughs> it's a space that uh, was established 2003, and it was uh, established with 10 artists in Iceland. And we kind of just lacked a place for um, <coughs> young artists to have an exhibition in. And we had found this, and we, none of us had much money, and we found this, uh, this place. <laughs> it's kind of interesting how small the photo is, but uh, it's an old photo from the internet, from the first exhibition space that was Kling, uh, Bank started in. And, um, and uh, we were just renting it out of our own pocket and inviting artists to show. And all of us came from different, uh, we, of course, most of us uh, studied in Iceland, but then we, we went all over um, to study in Scandinavia or America or, or um, Asia and um, you know, different parts of the world. So we all had different influences into the gallery. We called it the gallery, but it's kind of more of a project space, I think. But um, we started here upstairs, and we were there for one or two years. And then uh, in the same building, it was uh, when there were a lot of buildings free in the shopping street of Reykjavik, the main shopping street, and nothing was really happening. So. Uh, we were getting this uh, building for uh, very cheap and we could move downstairs where there used to be a sport shop and this was the first exhibition downstairs. So we had the whole house and ended up uh, renting the upper floor to the student for a student gallery. And then um, this was just the first thing. And then there was a cellar as well which we used very often for different projects as well. So this was kind of our situation for some years. And then the big boom happened. <laughs> and they wanted us out of, the, out of this place. So we actually ended up on the street for some months, but then we ended up getting a, a place from the same owners as had bought the other place actually. And because there were a lot of places that were possible to be used because they were kind of on the edge of being torn down to build bigger shopping malls, and this was one of them. So we got another place for a while, and I think it opened in 2008, and it was much bigger, and it influenced also our projects quite a bit. And just to have a, a dialogue with Forum Books, then we have a, <laughs> our called Petrivi, <laughs> doing a performance in our gallery as well, which is kind of nice. And um, so these are just kind of uh, pictures from this gallery. And now lately, um, they, they torn down the building, so it's, it's gone. So we, we are all again kind of with no, no building at all. And then, uh, because, uh, all of the artists run spaces that had opened up since uh, 2003. They were kind of are slowly clo you know, closing down. And uh, then the city decided to offer us and uh, another place called the Living Art Museum uh, a space 
which is much bigger and much uh, more um, established, I would say, because it's kind of a... So they offered us a, uh, the third floor in this building to uh, rent. And of course it's much more expensive and we've always uh, functioned as a both non-profit, even though we are not a non-profit organization, but there is ne never any profit and it never supposed to be. And uh, we also have never had the employee, so it's all volunteer work for then these 13 years. But if you go into an established place like this, you have to kind of rethink that and you have to yeah, we kind of have to rethink our whole strategy, I guess. You lose a bit of freedom, of course, when you get into a... Oliver Eliasson is going to be on the top floor, so you also get a different kind of um, establishment for some reason. But we are going to take on this project and see how it goes, anyway. But this is just a little brief uh, story about our housing. But I wanted actually to uh, mainly go in to talk about two projects, maybe because, uh, because it's about hyperculture and, and maybe it's not a hyperculture as such, but it's definitely some kind of um, open platform, I, I think, and uh, maybe also showing a little bit the, the openness of the gallery that it's not uh, this kind of um, gallery that's making a label that's supposed to be something. It's usually mostly about making things happen and, and creating something. So, um, in 2008, <laughs> when we actually got our uh, second place, can I show you? We found out that this bar, uh, Circus, which uh, we all had been going to, <laughs> it was a bar that most of the artists would go to, and it was kind of getting a known bar in Reykjavik for some reason. It was like really badly built, and it was tiny and uh, like a shack, but uh, there was often some things happening there, and all the music scene, you know, all of this well-known people from Iceland would be there, so it kind of became this kind of a landmark. But at the time they were rebuilding the shopping street, so they wanted to tear it down, which of course um, people were not so happy about. And maybe also we were thinking, how, because when you, to make a landmark like that, that people actually come to Iceland and ask for where can I find this bar, I, I would have to answer that question every time I would walk down Leverus. So it was, I was thinking that it's so interesting to not realize the value of, of people or of uh, establishment, things that happened, because it was a little bit like a cultural place. And um, so it was going to be torn down the same way as our housing was going to be torn down. And um, so we asked the, our landlords if we could uh, uh, kind of take most, of, you know, most things, help them tear down the bar, basically. Because we had uh, been offered to do a project in trees, like trees projects in uh, London, and we thought the best thing would be to show <coughs> this valuable thing that were, was not for non-value in Iceland, and to put it in this, you know, very nice art fair as a super value, kind of. And, and we kind of actually did that. We took all the facades and all the dust with us, all the bars and, you know, the dusty corners, nothing was cleaned, and we rebuilt it, basically. This bar, here we are. We're kind of cleaning, as you see, everything, and rebuilding it. <coughs> in London, please. And, um, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. I was, there's a lot of photos, but I was just gonna go slowly through. <laughs> but there we are rebuilding it. And we wanted to have it as a functioning bar. And the reason I'm kind of bringing this product up is that it is kind of, um, 
We actually never knew what it was. Was it a sculpture that we did, you know, as a group? Or was it a bar? Because we actually knew the bar owner and she came with us to London. And it was also her label and it was her bar, so she owned the project with us as well. And then uh, we also, um, there were a lot of people that missed this bar and we had a lot of friends that we would, uh, there's the bar owner, and uh, that we would ask to come to London and this is exactly at the time when the Icelandic bank, you know, the financial crisis happened actually, it's in October, where they said God bless Iceland in, in the TV the day before we flew to London and so this was also kind of weird, it became a weird, somehow a part of our project because you could not take out money because uh, they didn't trust Icelandic bank accounts and cards, so we had no way to have any money, you know, for our project. <laughs> it was kind of, everything was kind of interesting. But we had asked a lot of artists to come and perform or do a project inside this project, this bar project in Greece. And, um, and uh, so they actually came and there were a lot of interesting um, projects happening, this is inside the bar, <coughs> and it was very popular, it was kind of uh, un unexpected, but there was uh, always a crowd and the bar was really functioning well and it was also open venue for any artist that wanted to come and show art, so it also became a gallery somehow functioning inside this bar. So. Um, and uh, we also had the concerts. This is one last piece outside of the thing. And we had lineups, so not everyone got into the bar because we were not allowed to have too many people at the same time. And people would they maybe hang out in the bar the whole entire time <coughs> of the after. It was a, the closed after at seven o'clock in the night, but it was then like three o'clock in the morning kind of um, atmosphere. You know, people doing all, everything. So, it, so I'm showing you all these party photos, but maybe that's part of it because it was really a party. And I was often working behind the bar as a bartender and as a gallerist and as an artist. And I was talking to people of all levels and. And, and at the same time, I would ask them to pay five pounds for the beer. So it was a kind of a, a layered thing. <laughs> there you had the people could sign up if they wanted to uh, perform or do something in the, in the menu. And, um, <coughs> and there were also concerts and bankers coming. <laughs> and and it was also open to, of course, all friends that we knew from here and there. There were so many people that gathered in Greece, <coughs> either as working for galleries or something. So they, this is a friend from New York, so they would be also coming and doing projects. So it was quite of a very live um, menu. different performances and uh, maybe what I thought you know, then we would be asked so how much does it cost and people were actually thinking of buying it and and for us it was a little confusing because we were not thinking in marketing terms so so we I forget we said some number that, <laughs> that came into financial times as something, but we really didn't, you know, understand what we would be selling either, because it's um, it's a it's a culture inside. It's not it's not only the shell, you know, that we brought there. The, the shell is just a <coughs> container for making a, a platform for all these things to happen, and and this atmosphere. It's like um, 
it like a, a kind of moving an atmosphere to a place and moving it into a strange uh, artistic situation that's uh, very business-like and and for example we were, <laughs> we, were, we thought it was very ironic that um, Yoko Ono was going to have a lecture about importance of live performance <laughs> and we were asked not to have our live performance <laughs> going on because we would interrupt her <laughs> lecture about the importance of life performance. And, and there were all these kind of little layers. We were not, uh, not super popular with everyone, of course not somehow, but, but at the same time also. So it was this, it has this many. But for me personally, I thought the project um, um, kind of established itself mostly when you had other artists performing in it. When I saw the performances and other people coming and showing and doing stuff, that's when then it became so much more than a bar. The bar was just a kind of a way to lure everyone in because it had this these 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 ladies were were singing um, God save the Queen with the <laughs> so for for uh, Christoph Bucher had hired them for that. So it was uh, many different interesting projects going on. And maybe I thought it was some kind of a link to a hyperculture when you kind of lay things out and it's not supposed to be anything except the culture that, that ultimately is established by people. And this is this. And then it ended up in a container and it's still there <laughs> in Iceland. <laughs> and always uh, we've been asked to open up this bar in so many cases and places. And, but of course, you know, we do it for the first time. It's like mostly volunteer work and, and you have this this power of the artist, and, but you can't do it the same way again. You have to kind of, uh, then you have to pay artists to come, you know, you have to kind of, you can't just expect things to happen automatically, especially if it's like uh, established. Mm -hmm. So it has never been open again, but it might happen. We, we haven't um, um, ruled that out. But, um, yeah, and the interesting part with the money, which was interesting because we were a functioning bar, so we actually got paid in cash, and that's how we could build our bar, you know, how we could continue our project, and it was kind of a weird <laughs> situation to, uh, to have suddenly this bar that you're getting money to be able to run, you know, this project, because all the bank accounts were closed because we were from Iceland and was, we were really not popular in, in UK at the time but somehow it all worked out and so this was maybe just an introduction, you know, introduction to one project done 2008 but um, then I wanted to introduce another project and it's maybe similar in that way that it's also kind of undefined of like the same way, what is the art and who is the artist and, and the authorship of, of you know, the work or it's kind of um, open, flowing thing. And it's, uh, it's actually, it was the same year and after this big project that costed so much, more mo so much money and effort and energy, that we were completely exhausted and we had no money <coughs> at all. But we had been offered to take part in this No Soul for Sale, a festival of independence that was uh, being hosted for the first time in New York, in the old Dia Center. And I thought it, you know, I had, I really thought we should do it even though we only had money for the airplane tickets. <laughs> And uh, nobody, <laughs> there was no energy in the gallery, so I actually went alone with actually an intern that was great. And, uh, and, and, and we, I decided that the only thing we could 
afford to do, <laughs> especially when we're alone, you know, when you can't do so much physically, that we should, uh, we have been showing a lot of artists that have done some different kind of videos and performances that we had on video. So we established some kind of a video archive. And this is what I just did beforehand, so I could just bring everything with me <coughs> and all our projectors too, and, uh, <coughs> and do a pop-up kind of thing <coughs> for this one week that we have this festival in, in New York. And that's how kind of uh, this video archive that we call, call confected video archive and we later got that name actually, but that's how it started kind of to be established as a video archive, but uh, this is just the installation shots from that um, show. And we could, uh, <coughs> we could uh, have different group shows every day, because you have 100 uh, work, so we would do different like we would be VJing all the time different shows, so it was kind of a live venue and um, very, very well received. Oops, oh my, sorry. And, um, and uh, later on, um, after this, we uh, were offered to come to Copenhagen also in 2008 and, uh, and again we, we brought the archive there. So it kind of started to become, you know, and then later we met, we, I had asked a friend of mine, an artist from here actually, from Hamburg, Sebastian Rush, who uh, I asked to, we asked to come and, and perform actually at our um, Copenhagen alternative. And there he saw this archive, which I was, you know, always changing these videos. And, and then when um, he opened up a new space here, in Dore de Sluter Gallery, he invited us to come and show the archive as a, as a piece. So this is a, from that show. And then uh, we kind of uh, established it further and, and started calling it the confected video archive because it wasn't really an archive, it was maybe, you know, some kind of group of things and, and, uh, and I decided to um, ask also people to do special work for this, in this case, it was like 10 screens that we had on the wall, this is how we showed it in this particular time. So I had asked three people to do special uh, work, so it also starts to kind of initiate, uh, initiate uh, new work. So it becomes also like a platform that people start to feed in and maybe it starts to lower some creative energy. And then uh, it was presented in another gallery, so this is kind of maybe why I'm <laughs> talking about this project because it's interesting when a gallery is presented in other galleries, but this is maybe, again, this kind of blurry line, what it is and, and who's what and who's the ownership and maybe what we like, actually. And that was in a, also, start, <laughs> we were also asked to, asked to be a starting case for a TT bolting in a gallery. And that was the, in 2011. And then we were also taking part in the art, in the festival, uh, Reykjavik Art Festival. And there we decided to continue with this video archive. And uh, there uh, Ingebjörg in uh, Sigurjónsdóttir decided to curate like an uh, installation with the archive. And we also had the pen screen as part of it. But this is her installation and it was called uh, the Demented Diamond. The confected, it's getting very long <laughs> with the archive of Klingenbahn. So you see here some shots of that installation. And, um, and this has uh, been going to uh, also to Switzerland, this, you know, this kind of type of installation. So the, and also was an influencing or part of um, 
a program in Iceland that was called the night, night, night screening. And it were when the TV is off at night, uh, they show video art. You know, it's like a program that happens for a month or two where they were showing, and we were kind of taking part in that as well. So, but maybe what I wanted to bring up as a question or an interest is maybe this kind of uh, the projects that kind of grow and and everyone can be a part of it and everyone can you know, kind of interact or have it, it's not like um, a ownership or a, um, it's, a, it's more about the creative force or something like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> what do you think? No. <laughs> Nobody asked me a question, I thought I was going to be chatting the whole time. <laughs> But if, if something is unclear, you should ask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so clear. How is the uh, visual arts finance in Iceland at the moment? Or how does it seem the uh, atmosphere for funding visual art or yeah. artists or galleries? Yeah, I, I think um, I w I've, I've been saying um, it's not very popular. Finance um, is not at all. <laughs> it's really a pity, you know. Design is much more popular as a thing, and there, there was a founding for. Uh, they have like some founding for, I think, music and design, like project uh, money, and fine arts. And the fine arts was the only one that kind of was uh, cut half. You know, they all started out to be the same. So there's something about fine arts that uh, there uh, that I think is having a it's not very popular somehow. I think there's something that we need to do about that. But um, I don't know. It's not really financed very much. You have a you have a national gallery and it's suffering, you know. And if you show there as an artist you almost never ask for anything special because you know then you you know you will almost get the you know director himself coming to do it you know because it's there is no no, no money somehow it's really it's really not not uh, there but there's a lot of uh, and maybe that's why we've been running this gallery as well because uh, to live in a place like in Iceland it's in the middle of the Atlantic physically <laughs> And it's like, then you need, you need to do something and you need ma to make things happen to, uh, you know, to get, you know, maybe en energy from, from it yourself or to be able to live there. And also for us, this, uh, th that's the reason a lot of our projects are abroad, but most of the time they come with some kind of money. We, we never uh, have money to, uh, we can get a little grant, like in this case, with no souls for sale, which did not have any money per se, but but it was kind of an opportunity still, an interesting thing to um, also to uh, introduce Icelandic artists or young artists that we were working with. Or, and maybe I shouldn't say necessarily Icelandic because it doesn't really matter. It's more just the group that's working with us and and kind of putting their creative creativity in, in, in our projects that are being introduced. Can I ask a question? The videos that you have in the archive, were they individual artists' videos, or how do they come out? People have been involved for a length of time and you just have... Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was that we, when we started to, we started to establish it, we would just contact all these artists that have been showing in, in the gallery yeah. and ask them to, if we could use it, the ones that, that they had shown, and if they would wanted to contribute some more, and then we would uh, yeah, do some categorizing that was somehow more like a curatorial <laughs> idea. But it's still growing, and that's kind of the nice thing is that uh, uh, 
like I think the last one was in 2016, and then the people then we sent out letters again that we would want to uh, if people wanted to, you know, put more stuff into their archive, and also we are often asking people to um, do solo kind of projects within all of the screens. Like if we if we had this demented diamond, they had like six projectors. And then people are asked to do a solo show with these six projectors, so people would do different things. And then that becomes part of the archive. So it's like, so it's still it's growing. Really yeah. More layers. Absolutely, yeah. And different, so, it, so it's kind of uh, existing in many different ways, somehow, this archive. And for me, it's a, well, the interesting part maybe, and that's why I, I wanted to, Establish it was that you have like all of a sudden this kind of focus. It's not many years. It's you know it started when when it was in 2008, and it, then it's this spanning maybe 10 years. But it's this focus and, and kind of collecting things that I know later artists would call us and ask us for the material because and yeah. also people are losing their digital, you know data and you know things so we were kind of also protecting yeah. you know things that uh, you know people wanted to get back so it was kind of an interesting thing like that and it, it's like a database and, and it functions some, somehow still differently than an actual database because it's a uh, yeah it's so more we have it this, uh, yeah it's more a you know place to Play around then as well. I, I don't really, I don't know if it's a question, but if you ask, ask you know, about this, uh, how do we feel, how do I feel about this um, conceiving art and doing something together? And um, just maybe as a remark, I really liked uh, what you were describing about the bar you, you did, and also the, because I think that's many times the case that it develops a dynamic itself, which wasn't foreseeable at the beginning. And Mm -hmm. uh, the results come out of, you know, sometimes very economic limitations, and, and then we're looking for a way to, to well, to, to fill the needs, to, to find another way to resolve that problem. And, and what I really would find interesting for a discussion would be, um, it seems to me that that's a different, that, that it's a specific concept of art being so open as it is, as a community and people doing something together, which. Um, as you said, you know, to survive or to, to, be, to feel alive in Iceland, maybe that's necessary, but maybe it's necessary everywhere. And uh, maybe people sometimes aren't interested in, in art because it has been for so long, it's quite a few thing which uh, sometimes has been misused as being, uh, you know, rather like, like a trophy, right? I mean, you know, the artist and art's a trophy, it's an element of distinction, making other people feel little and all that, you know. Mm -hmm. And so what I would find interesting would be in a discussion about if, if art becomes popular and, and the community thing, um, still there's a difference between, it's, it's, not, it's not trivial, you know? Mm -hmm. and, but there are other things which, which are trivial and, and I sometimes wonder where, where, to, where to draw the line, right? I, yeah, with the popularity, I mean, or something, uh, or it's, you mean, uh, no, I, I feel that there is a, that, that, you can, that you can sense the difference between something being popular um, but not trivial. And yeah, yeah, yeah. then there are other things which are trivial, which is why for so long people said, no, 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 don't popularize art, don't popularize things because it becomes trivial. I think that's not true. And the, um, it's interesting to think about um, what it means for art to be an activity um, which involves people. Mm -hmm. um, and which can be popular, but without being economized, without being mm -hmm. utilized. And I, I don't have the answer. I just no, no, exactly. I think it's an interesting question. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, if I understand it, yeah. I, I was just wondering, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but because you're talking about, for example, because it's a bar and then it's 
mm. and already have some kind of popularity mm. as a bar and an entertainment field. Mm. And maybe that's uh, why I was saying that when, uh, when the artist came in, that's what, when I thought it was really actually functioning because uh, then it became something much more than the bar or the popularity. There, there's something, and, and, and it got the voice, you know, these performances, they, 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 they really functioned. <laughs> it was kind of interesting. And, and they functioned just as well there in this situation. Of course, they were all kind of modeled into the situation as any performance in the white cube. It was like, you would get the same experience out of it. At the same time, you would not have to have a very strict um, selection or a very strict kind of editing. Of course, you are already with a selection because it's people that know you and you are somehow in a dialogue with. So it's not like everyone would come there and do something. Of course, it was an open venue, so that's possible, but but somehow it is a dialogue as well. So, so I think in this case, maybe just the popularity was maybe just uh, yeah, maybe just a way to I don't know, maybe a way to um, be able to make things happen or something like that, you know, as a as a tool in that way, but. Not really, we don't use it, we don't use it as such, though. Mm -hmm. And I don't think things should, you know, personally, I, I don't, I think I like boring things, you know. So, you know, I, I really don't think things should be entertaining, you know, not at all. But, but it's like, um, yeah, but obviously when you're working with a lot of people and if you want to, to make things happen, it automatically happens that it becomes a full of energy and that is always uh, attractive I think because people are, people you know everyone likes to be where there's shining energy so I think maybe that, that's the, that's a popularity thing it's this energy of, of uh, creative force I think it's a nice sentence <laughs> <laughs> yeah. how do you find moving back and forth between being an artist and an organizer yeah, exactly. Because I, it is a tough one, and it was really. <laughs> this is what I felt so much with uh, when I was uh, talking about when I was the bartender as well. <laughs> bartender, and then I was talking to really important people in the arts, you know, that really could do everything for you, you know, <laughs> whatever. And I'm there as the bartender, and you know, then the gallerist, and you know, and also the artist, and you don't know even where to begin. <laughs> talking to those people because you don't even have anything to sell. So it's like, uh, you know, but it's an interesting thing, but I, I can't really mix it easily, but, but I, maybe these two projects are very close to some of the things that I'm doing somehow, even though it's a much smaller scale and it's more personal, but I do open up in my own art a venue where I ask, you know, for example, I ask people to lie, uh, write songs. There is a sculptor that I've asked people to write for the sculptor, but a sincere lo love song. So, uh, and that sculptor is now has, I think, 10 or 11 songs and it's been shown in places. But it's like, um, I'm obviously asking people to create something new into my creation. So it's a, so I think it, there is something, and maybe that's why I, I decided to talk about these two projects because it's something of mine there as well. So, so you don't divide? I think no. I think uh, somehow, and also because I'm also a teacher, and it somehow all got into, uh, into my art as well. Mm -hmm. And for example, I, because I'm also a curator, you know, you're doing everything. You know, when you're in Iceland, there's so few people, you have to be at least three people to, to you know, to kind of fill up the, the needs of, of the country, and, and I did, did that share. And, uh, and I think that's the thing, well, part of my work is, um, I was making, like, into the structure, like the architectural structure, I would be making kind of walls out of paper you could go through, so it's not, uh, 
dangerous, but it's maybe changing the whole architectural aspect. And I think I started doing that. Actually, when you saw a picture, there was one in the, in the first shot of the video archive. But I started doing it, you know, also as to divide spaces when I was curating. So I just made art, <laughs> because I don't like uh, unnecessary things. So, it, you know, the art becomes also the help tool for an exhibition. And I use it for my own exhibitions as well. I think it's interesting in this space because I think a lot of people here are artists and curators and gallerists and internally I think we all don't divide it up so much but externally the rest of the world wants to know when we're wearing different hats mm -hmm. and, then, and I think it, it, it um, there's like some sort of explosion when the world wants us to be something even though like in our inner own minds we're doing multiple things at the same time. Maybe, maybe it's not problematic, maybe it is. And I'm following up that with an idea, just thinking about what, how you were saying it. It's, it seems as slippery a slope in either direction that the social material as a basis for an artwork, it appears as a form in the same way that like what we would indicate a polished form or a pedestal form or a trophy form at the same time, right? Once it's understood mm -hmm. as a photograph of a specific conversation with folks sitting around a picnic table, it's repeatable as a form. So yeah. I think it's really challenging to try to build this distance between thinking of artwork in this way. I mean, if we accept that artwork can be dialogical, maybe we can, you know, not create a hierarchy for yeah. a contemporary work, way of working versus a traditional way of working with material, because I think that's a kind of a pitfall. Yeah. The same way as institutional performance role versus individual performance role versus citizen performance role versus parent performance role, friend for parent, <laughs> you know, life. Right. Right. Exactly. Thank you so much.